Transistors are widely recognized as one of the most defining revolutions of the modern digital age. As technology evolves, so do the materials and the capabilities exhibited by semiconductor devices. Silicon carbide is one of these material evolutions, with growth across many industry sectors expected to see on the order of over 6x growth over the next six years. As the component demands increase, we can expect to see continued reductions in footprint, resistance, and losses across applications spanning from automotive to industrial to consumer devices. Welcome to today's Tech Chat, sponsored by Mauser Electronics, where we chat with engineering experts about the latest technical innovations that are shaping and reshaping our world. Today, we are excited to chat with Pete Losey, Senior Engineering Manager of Power Device Solutions at United Silicon Carbide, which is now Corvo, to talk about some of the advancements in the world of transistors, namely silicone carbide field effect transistors. Welcome to the Tech Chat, Pete. Thanks. Thanks for having me. And uh, thanks for giving me a chance to talk about uh, United Silicon Carbide, now Corvo's uh, Gen 4 Silicon Carbide FETs and how they're really enhancing EV charging. Okay, so yeah, let's get started. We can look in this slide and uh, Silicon Carbide expects a huge growth forecast at annual growth rate of 34% as per predicted by uh, the 2022 Yole development report. We show this picture here where the total silt and carbide market is expected to grow to over $6 billion by 2027. And if you look at the sort of orange piece of this pie, you'll see that the automotive segment is actually the biggest piece of the adoption. If we sort of drill down in, into that part of the pie and look at automotive, you know, the one that gets the most press these days is in the traction inverter. But there's a lot of adoption in silicon carbide in DC-DC converters for auxiliary supply and infotainment sy systems. And also the one that I'll talk about today being the onboard charger. And so typical sort of EV systems may be at 400 volt bus, but with the efficiency uh, offered by silicon carbide at higher voltages, you can get more power by moving up to an 800 volt bus. Now, I do have a quick question on the split of this graph. Uh, I noticed that the industrial section is uh, a fairly large chunk and expected to grow also quite a bit. Uh, what are some examples of silicone carbide technology used in industrial applications? Yes. Yeah, so again, if you dive into that, you'll see a fairly robust sort of charging seg segment in industrial charging. And then in the future, um, industrial motor drives. And the industrial charging, I assume that probably has a, a fairly similar growth pattern to the adoption of autonomous vehicles and some of the AGV technologies and even autonomous, maybe um, flight mobile technologies as well. Correct. Yeah. Starting with sort of simple forklift charging, but then moving into all autonomous sort of adaptations that that allows. I know in the logistics sector, that's been a, a big discussion recently. Correct. Yeah. So today I'll focus on our Gen 4 technology. At United Silicon Carbide, we offer an innovative solution to the power FET option based on silicon carbide vertical JFETs. And what I show on this slide is our Gen 4 silicon carbide JFET technology, which is a trench structure with very fine cell pitch an optimized drift layer and reduced substrate resistances. And so if you look at the plot on the right, it's really how we measure sort of the performance entitlement of unipolar devices. So single carrier devices, maybe Schottky diodes or MOSFETs or JFETs. And sort of the standard way we look at this is we look at RDS on per unit area on the y-axis, and we look at the blocking voltage, which determines the voltage rating of the part on the x-axis. And silicon is shown here in, in black. And you can see clearly from the sort of light blue line that silicon carbide with its material properties offers substantial savings over silicon. And so you can start to use unipolar devices, which have very low switching losses with low conduction losses up to higher voltage ratings. Now within the silicon carbide and, and wide band gap regime, what you can see is that the silicon carbide JFET, vertical JFET, actually offers the lowest RDS on for a given voltage rating, which is the technology that gets closest to the entitlement line here of silicon carbide. And so for moving from our Gen 3 technology to our Gen 4 technology, we've been able to improve upon the, the previous benchmark performance by cutting that RDS on per unit area by 40 to 60% compared to our previous generation 650 or 1200 volt industry best FETs. So RDS on gives you lower conduction losses, but what it also gives you is for the same on resistance, a smaller die size. And that die size means more die per wafer, but it also means lower capacitances, which can be transferred into lower switching losses. So the one drawback of a vertical silicon carbide JFET is that it's a normally on device. 
uh, we call this a depletion mode device. When I say this, what it means is that it's fully enhanced with VGS equals zero volts, and then you need a negative gate bias to turn the device off. This is typically not used in power electronic circuits because of functional safety concerns. So our unique solution is that we make what's called a silicon carbide cascode FET. And in this case, we combine the silicon carbide JFET plus a low voltage silicon MOSFET to create a highly efficient normally off FET that still retains the best total on resistance per unit area. And just kind of show the, the, the schematic over here on the left. And the way you can kind of think about this simply is that the cascode is actually a source switch silicon carbide JFET. So if you look at the, the, the diagram here, the inverse of the MOSFET drain source voltage is actually applied across the JFET gate source voltage. So in the case of looking at whether it's normally on or normally off, let's look at applying a gate voltage of zero volts to the low voltage silicon MOSFET. When you apply zero volts, it's below threshold voltage and the impedance of the, the channel is turned off, the impedance of the MOSFET is high and that drain source voltage rises up to above the pinch off voltage of the JFET. The JFET is turned off and essentially supports all of the voltage across the device. So you en end up with a normally off switch. If you then turn around and look at the MOSFET, where let's say we MOSFET gate the MOSFET on, now the channel resistance, the channel is turned on and you go low impedance across the drain source of the MOSFET. This is far below the pinch off voltage of the silicon carbide JFET. So essentially the silicon carbide JFET becomes fully enhanced or, or fully turned on. And then you have the low resistance of the low voltage silicon MOSFET at the bottom. It also has an in, a very good integral diode. So in the case where the MOSFET is gated off and you apply a third quadrant bias, what you can see is that you have the 0.7 volt knee voltage of the low voltage silicon MOSFET and it's reverse conducting through the third quadrant of the silicon carbide JFET. So there's no bi bipolar injection in the silicon carbide JFET and you have a very low forward drop, a 0.7 volt knee voltage in series with the very low on resistance of the silicon carbide JFET. So the result is, a very high performance integral diode. And just keep in mind here that the low voltage silicon MOSFET, the total RDS on of this is typically 10% or less of the whole total switch. Now looking at that gate voltage, uh, I assume that for many applications, the gate voltage tolerances are able to, to adapt to many different logic levels like 12 volts, um, 12 volts or, or even less for that gate voltage to be able to turn that normally off sick FET on. Yeah, and so what you'll see here is we typically may have a pinch off voltage of the, J, the silicon carbide JFET of between, you know, maybe nine to, to four volts in the negative, right? And so that, that MOSFET there, the drain bias of, or, or drain rating of the, of the MOSFET only needs to be a low voltage device, typically a 20 volt device, which is very low on resistance. And then you'll see in the, in the later sort of slides that the other advantage of the cascode FET is that you get the full flexibility of driving a silicon MOSFET. And so now you are compatible with existing silicon solutions such as an IGBT or a silicon superjunction. So this is kind of further sort of uh, illustrated in this figure here. So on the left-hand side, basically I'm showing just a conventional power MOSFET. So this is a conventional silicon carbide D MOSFET. And so here the pie chart I sort of broke down of what a typical 1200 volt device might look like. And so if you re re remind yourself back to a few slides ago when I showed you what the the entitlement of RDS on versus blocking voltage or voltage rating was, it's really only dealing with that light green sort of shaded part of the pie, which is about 10 to, to, to 35%, depending on 650 volt to 1200 volt rating. The rest of the pie is essentially parasitic overhead resistance. And if we dig in and see what's the biggest portion of that pie, what you find is it's the channel resistance which can account from anywhere between 40 to 65% of the total resistance. And this is kind of stemming from the fact that the inversion mobility in silicon carbide still trails that of silicon. Silicon may be 10 times higher inversion mobility in a MOS channel. And so remember, we're replacing that silicon carbide MOS channel or the yellow portion of this pie with the channel of that low voltage silicon MOSFET in the cascode FET. So something that I said was well below 10% often. So this gives the advantage of a lower RDS on per unit area for the cascode FET compared to a conventional MOSFET. The other advantages come, as I said, the low integral forward drop because you're only dealing with a 0.7 volt knee voltage in the silicon MOSFET. In a wideband gap device, turning back to the figure on the left, the PN junction of the integral diode is actually built out of the silicon carbide. So in this case, the built-in potential may be between 2.8 and 3 volts, and the forward drop of that that integral diode is well over three volts. And this is sort of a material limited parameter oh, stemming from the wide band gap. And then the other sort of feature is the sort of gate drive. 
because I said that the, the silicon carbide MOSFET interface is still not quite ideal, there's some sort of nuance to it. And different vendors may optimize this structure differently. And so what you see when you look at a lot of components is that there's a lot of variability in the sort of allowable and recommended gate drives, both in the positive and negative side. And they tend to have a limited range. In the gate control of the cascode FET, it's really relying on the sort of very mature silicon MOSFET gate technology. So we can offer a full 5 volt threshold, a full plus or minus 20 volt VGS max range, and the device is essentially fully enhanced by about 10 volts. So you can give a recommended gate drive voltage of 0 to 12 or 0 to 15 volts, and it's compatible sort of, sort of with existing silicon carbide MOSFET solutions, but also with existing silicon or superjunction or IGBT gate drives. Now, moving back just, just a little bit there to looking at the channel resistance where the target seems to be a, a lower channel resistance uh, and, and resistance all around, you mentioned earlier that the size is uh, a big design uh, benefit, which is, is certainly true, but I know that also resistance leads to thermal issues and benefits of having a lower resistance and switching speed as well. That's right. So, you know, the drawbacks of, of higher resistance are obviously higher sort of I squared R loss in the conduction mode, but larger capacitance, oh, you know, from the larger die size, right? And so you'll tend to pay that back, let's say, in hard switching loss or soft switching delay times. So if I just sort of sum up all the benefits that come from the lower RDS on per unit area, I can define a, a, a set of figures of merit for, let's say, a 400 volt bus where I consider either 650 or 750 volt devices. And I can plot this radar chart of all of the sort of key parameters that one might consider for sort of hard switching or soft switching circuits. And sort of in this case, what I did was I basically normalized the Gen 4 silicon carbide FET, the 750 volt FET, to the unit value of one. And so you can see quickly that sort of the octagon of blue is sort of the lowest radius, so smaller is better here. And so there's not really a compromise on any of what these key parameters, right? So that's the first thing you notice. The second thing you just notice is if you kind of walk around, you know, the, the radar chart clockwise, you'll kind of sort of quantify or visualize the answer to the question you asked, posed on the previous slide. We start with the lower RDSA, right? And this is true at both 25C and a practical use temperature up to 125C. We talked about the lower forward drop of the, dead, uh, of the diode, the integral diode. So this will give you lower dead time losses if your VF is lower, right? And so now you're talking about a VF in a cascode fed of about one to one and a half volts, as opposed to anywhere between three to five volts with a conventional MOSFET. If we look at sort of a parameter that might be a figure of merit for hard switching loss, being the RDS on times EOSS, which is the energy stored in that output capacitance, you see an advantage here because it's really stemming from the lower die size. And again, the, the other sort of parameter in soft switching circuits may be the RDS on times the COSS time related. So here, this is a sort of a, a measure of delay time when you're trying to, to turn off with sort of very low currents. And so you'll see the die size uh, plays a big role in minimizing that and giving an advantage all, basically around the entire radar chart. That is really interesting to see all those compared in that that chart that can simultaneously look at all the features and benefits as compared to to the multiple different competitors. It's a, a really interesting way of being able to visualize all of that information. So on the next slide, basically, we might you know slice this along each parameter and maybe an easier way to sort of visualize it. So in here, in this case, basically what I'm showing is I'm showing the RDS on times area in absolute terms. And then the parameter RDS on times EOSS and then RDS on COSS time related. And sort of the darker shades may be a, a high use condition of 125C and 25C being a sort of room temperature, uh, more ideal condition. And so you can see the benefits of the, of the silicon carbide cascode FETs, the Gen 4 FETs, is they offer the lowest conduction loss across the useful temperature. They offer the lowest EOSS times RDS on. And then they offer a very low RDS on times COSS. And then you can combine this with typically a lower gate charge and the fact that I said you can drive from, let's say, 0 to 12 volts. In some of these soft switching circuits, like I said, the, the, the cascode FET may be fully enhanced at 10 volts. So now you can really cut down on your driver losses because you can drive at a lower voltage swing and feeding a lower QG. And that excellent body diode, which has a very low recovery charge and a low VF, will allow you to, to operate potentially out even outside of resonance and soft switch converters. 
So here I, I show sort of the rollout of our 750 volt silicon carbide FET product family with the conventional TU247 three lead, TU247 four lead, which has the Kelvin source connection and the, the surface mount package in the TU263 or D2 pack uh, seven lead. And as we kind of mentioned in the previous slides, they come with all the sort of performance benefits of the silicon carbide cast code FET technology. For the higher RDS on parts or lower current parts, we offer these in the three lead as an option. But if you really want to get the most performance and cleanest waveforms, go into a Kelvin source connected package like a T247 four lead or D2 back seven lead is really the right choice. So those two options would most likely be the, the ones that a customer would be more interested in looking at for most applications. Um, it really depends on the power level, right? And so what you can do is what you can look at the higher power or systems where, where you may have a, a lot of, let's say, switching loss and you're, and you're using a larger device, you may use the look at, at such as the 6 milliohm or, or up to the 11 milliohm part. These you'd want to use a sort of Kelvin connected part. Um, with the sort of lower current parts, then the, the, you know, the effect of the common source inductance in the three lead part becomes less of a problem and you get away with sort of your standard three pin configuration, which may match your existing design as more of a drop in replacement. Okay. So yeah, I was just going to ask about that because we, I, I do hear that come up very often in discussions is as far as drop in replacements. Uh, and so that, that three, three lead package is a little bit more likely than to be suitable for a drop in replacement for some applications at least. Uh, yeah, I, I think in the early days of wide band gap as, but, uh, you know, as people sort of have continued to evaluate the wave, waveform cleanliness versus the sort of, uh, switching speed, you're seeing more and more adoption of the Kelvin source connected packages. So on this slide, what we can do is we can look at sort of the difference driving down into the TU247-4 lead, which is essentially the industry standard sort of workhorse being the 247 and the D2 pack seven lead surface mount option. What you'll notice with silk and carbide and wide band gap is that you're able to start achieving very low losses and very low on resistances into surface mount packages, which really weren't an option for the larger silicon die. And so we have sort of the D2 pack seven lead down to offer down to nine million. And the table on the right, we're basically showing a side by side of what the parameters you might get from a 247 and a D2 pack seven lead, right? And so in the D2 pack seven lead, you can increase your creepage and clearance distance while reducing your parasitic inductance down to, let's say, three to five nanohenries versus the sort of more inductive leaded TU247 through hole part where you may get 10 to 15 nanohenries of inductance. So you can imagine the switching performance of the surface mount is better, but it comes at the cost of smaller die pad area. And so basically, uh, you have to look at your system figure out what the, the right rated part you want is, and then what the sort of thermal management constraints are, whether you choose a D2-back 4 lead or, or a D2-back 7 lead or a TU247 4 lead. We'll show sort of an example of that in the following slides. Yeah, let's take a look at that because when I first see this, the certainly the thermal management of the, the larger size seems to be a little bit more manageable. And at first glance, you know you're correct about that. But keep in mind, wide band gap is very efficient. And so that now thermally managing surface mount components, uh, which used to be not very easy, can be very doable. And so in this slide, what we're basically showing is we're showing the sort of expected or model thermal performance of a TU247 four lead on the top and a D2 pack seven lead on the bottom. And in this case, we use sort of a ceramic isolator for the TU247 with thermal grease. And in the case of the D2 pack seven lead, we're using a sort of a conventional IMS structure where we have a, a copper foil on top of a dielectric layer. And in the case study we've done here, we looked at 18 milliohm and 44 milliohm sort of spanning this portfolio of parts. And what you'll see is that really while the junction to case might be quite similar from the, for the two sort of package options, the case to fluid is quite a bit different. And so obviously the TU247 four lead offers the advantage here, the model to be around adding an extra 0.4 degrees C per watt, uh, whereas the D2 pack 7 lead with the smaller paddle size will get you in the neighborhood of 0.9 to, to 1.1 degrees C per watt. So in the following example, basically what we did for the 247 is we looked at, okay, let's assume conservatively the case to fluid is about 0.6. And for the D2 pack 7 lead on IMS, we assume a conservative sort of junction, excuse me, case to fluid of about 1.2 degrees C per watt. 
And so what we do here is we plug our portfolio into our online cal loss calculator called FetJet. And just to sort of shout out to FetJet here, you can, you can use this real time from our website. There's no registration required. It has, it's been pre-populated with the, the loss and loss versus temperature and load current curves of all of our released parts. Uh, you can easily download sort of design reports and it's preloaded with essentially all of the, the relevant sort of power switching topologies. So in this case, we're looking at what might be a conventional 6.6 .6 kilowatt front end for an OBC for a 400 volt bus. And so in this case, we're using two parts per fast leg position and keeping the slow leg position constant. We're comparing sort of from that 18 to 60 milliohm option, uh, both of the TO247 or the D2PAC7 lead. And what you can see from the rightmost column is the semiconductor efficiency is you know, predicted to be over 99% for any of these options. If you sort of work back to the left, you'll see the junction temperature, and this is assuming a heat sink starting temperature of 80 degrees C, is very manageable, whether you're using that 247 4 lead or the D2 pack 7 lead. And sort of the 18 to 60 milliohm parts offer a nice option. If you want to sort of really operate cool, you might choose the 18 milliohm. And if you want to really look at moving to sort of maybe a more optimum cost performance, you might move up to the 40, 33, 44, or 60 milliohm all still with very reasonable sort of junk expected junction temperatures and all still with that efficiency that's up over 99 percent. that's that's an impressive efficiency level even at the higher rate that's correct and this is just counting the semiconductor losses in this calculation so one thing you'll notice though is is again if you want to operate at the same temperature then you'll probably have to go to one step down to lower on resistance part with the d2 back seven lead just sort of stemming from that extra case to fluid thermal resistance that we mentioned before. But still, you know, the 6.6 .6 kilowatt front end here is very addressable for from any of the parts in that portfolio. We can apply the same exercise to the DC-DC converter stage. So here we use a soft switch uh, converter or CLLC, and we're using the looking at that same portfolio of parts in the primary side of the isolated DC-DC converter. So in this case, Again, you see very high efficiencies as expected because of the fully soft switch converter. The devices offer a very low conduction loss. And so a very manageable temperature rise uh, expected from 18 to 60 milliohm. The same sort of result is, is true here where to get to the same junction temperature rise, you may have to go to, to one step down in our portfolio of the D2 pack seven lead. I was just gonna point out here at the top and um, in the ratings, these, so this, this case study and the, the simulation results were driven by the 400 volt bus application for the numbers that are seen in that table there? That's correct. Later on in the presentation, we'll, we'll look at sort of how the 1200 volt parts address the 800 volt bus charging applications. So the takeaway here is that you may see a higher efficiency depending on the, on the D2 pack 7 lead switching losses, but it must account for the, the sort of thermal performance when you make your optimum choice. I'll just point out that the soft switch converter allows you actually to, like I said in the, in the past, to mi further minimize the gate charge as you can drive to even as low as zero to 10 volts with the cascode FET. So we can move sort of as the sort of bus voltage on the, on the vehicle moves up to 800 volts, we can start to look at the same sort of exercise with our Gen 4 1200 volt FETs. So here we can start with sort of this radar chart where again, I've normalized our 1200 volt silicon carbide cascode FETs as a, as a value of unity. And we'll step around the, the radar chart. Again, the lower RDS on per unit area allows us to get to an ad advantageous position of RDS on teams EOSS uh, and lower RDS on times COSS time related. Again, we had, we had mentioned the lower RDS on times QG, you see. I didn't put the diode forward drop in this radar chart, but you see, you'll again see a lower forward drop of the integral diode being about one to one and a half volts at the 1200 volt device, as opposed to three, three and a half volts. So that still sort of remains the lower dead time losses. And then I also put another parameter on here, which is the lower R theta JC or thermal resistance junction to case. So to extract the full benefit of what RDS on times unit area gives you or, or a smaller die size, you really have to be able to not compromise on the power handling capability of the chip, right? And so what you know is that as you shrink the die, the thermal resistance in the package goes up. And so what you see from the technology we've employed is actually an innovative silver sinter technology 
which allows us to cut down our thermal resistance junction to case. So even though we offer 1200 volt FETs with smaller die size, here I'm just showing a, a competitor gray square with a, with a scaled sort of blue box of the, the die area of our 30 milliohm part, we do so with still a lower thermal resistance junction to case. And so on the bar chart here, you'll see that we typically run a, a lower uh, thermal resistance, even though we have a smaller die size. So, so this allows us to get the full benefit of the lower conduction losses and not compromise on power or current handling capability. Because usually it would seem like you'd compromise in one area, uh, but then run the risk of, a, of either having to have a larger area or a greater resistance but it looks like this one accomplishes both of those. Correct, and this is sort of afforded by the superior die attached technology. Okay, and much like we did with the 750 volt parts, we can sort of slice that radar chart, which is maybe easily to visualize by looking at bar charts with the 1200 volt uh, silk and carbide cascode FET at 25C and a practical use temperature up to 125C across the different parameters, right? And similar to the 750 volt FETs, it's the lowest already assigned times the OSS, they have a low QRR integral diode, as we've mentioned. And then for soft switching, a very low COSS TR, a lower QG, which you can drive at zero to 12 volts, right? And so both really good choices for both soft and hard switching applications. So we ro rolled this sort of performance out in our existing 1200 volt Gen 4 silicon carbide series, which is named UF4C or SC series. And right now we're offering between 23 to 70 milliohm parts. These are offered in Q247 four leads, again, with the lower RDS on, higher current parts being offered in the four lead, and then the higher RDS on, lower current parts being offered in either the conventional Q247 three lead or four lead part. And so this one does not have that third option that the 600 volt family did. Uh, this will come in the future. That will be the, maybe the topic of our next ch chalk talk. And absolutely, that'll always be the goal. Keep that the footprint down while keeping the, the losses down as well. Correct. So in this figure, we're basically just showing a left to right comparison of our previous generation UF3C 40K4S versus the lower on resistance UF4C 30K4S. And so again, uh, as I said, the die size cut was pretty substantial from Gen 3 to Gen 4. And this affords us a lower on resistance, lower switching losses. So you can see the data sheet cited uh, switching loss at 30 amps, 800 volts, reducing from 800 microjoules, which was already a pretty good number, down to about 500 microjoules. The EOSS has come down and the COSS time related has also dropped. So again, addressing sort of lower switching losses and lower conduction losses with the new Gen 4 series. And that's an impressive difference from one generation to the next. Those are those are substantial decreases. I see like in the capacitance, that's almost a 50% reduction in the capacitance. Correct. Okay, so much like we did for the 400 volt bus case, we could look at the 1200 volt Gen 4 sick FETs in relevant uh, circuit topologies for an 800 volt DC bus uh, onboard charging system. So in this case, we're looking at the uh, three-phase active front end with a power level of 11 kilowatts. The input voltage is 230 volts. We, for the, you know, just because the performance and switching losses of silicon carbide is so low, we actually used our fetch jet calculator to, to go up to as high as 150 kilohertz here with a heat sink temperature of 80 degrees C. And we assume the 0.6 degrees C per watt case to, to heat sink, as we talked about in the model. And again, we're doing sort of a side-by-side -side comparison of the Gen 3 40K4S with the Gen 3, or, or Gen 3 40K4S with the Gen 4 30K4S. And what you see is when you do this side-by-side -side comparison, we've actually reduced the die size, we've reduced the losses, coming from 44 watts down to 37 watts. We've improved the efficiency uh, with the losses dropping uh, at seven, down to 74 watts per phase. And we've actually made the device run cooler. And so again, capitalizing on losses and a die size shrink and while still running cooler. So this is just an example of offering excellent cost performance options in the OBC front end. Much like we did with the 400 volt bus, we can now take a design example using 11 kilowatt full bridge CLLC. So looking at the isolated DC-DC converter stage in the charging system. And here we're looking again now at our, because the switching losses are much reduced in the soft switching circuit, you're really relying on the conduction losses of the devices. And so we can use a smaller part here. I'm, con I'm comparing our 80 milliohm UF3C K4S from our previous generation to now our UF4C 53K4S. And in this case, I chose to use a similar die size, 
And so these are pretty similar die sizes, but the, redu the losses are reduced from 17.6 watts down to 14. We've improved our efficiency. And again, we see a cut in, in sort of thermal requirements so it runs cooler. Excellent efficiency, excellent cost performance options, again, for the isolated DC-DC converter stage as well. While we discuss the EV OBC, silicon carbide and certainly these Gen 4 silicon carbide FETs are seeing adoption in many applications, including IT infrastructure, server power supplies, industrial battery charging, industrial power supplies, DC-DC converters, welding, UPS, and even induction heating. So I'd like to thank you for giving me the time to discuss our Gen 4 silicon carbide FETs and how they're offering excellent performance in onboard and off-board EV charging applications. We offer now a variety of resistances and packages with our expanded portfolio. And really, we find that they're ideal for both the front end and the isolated DC-DC stages. So thank you from the folks at United Silicon Carbide is now Corvo. Well, Pete, thank you very much for that awesome discussion. It's really exciting to see how the generations of technology have evolved to make such uh, great improvements on an already excellent silicone carbide VET technology. And before we sign off, I want to encourage everyone to check out all the latest United Silicone Carbide, it's now Corvo, products at Mauser Electronics, our sponsor for today's Tech Chat. And a special thanks to Pete Losey for his insight and experience in the field of semiconductor technology. Please join us again next time for our Tech Chats, where we chat with the leading technical experts like Pete, who are changing our world every day.